Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for coming out to Exploration, Monitoring, and Security with OS Query. My name is Zach Wasserman. I'm the co-founder and principal engineer at Collide. And uh, today we'll be doing a very broad and hopefully somewhat deep introduction to uh, what we can do with OS Query. So this uh, will be an interactive talk. And in order to prepare for that, I would ask you all, if you don't already have it, please uh, download and install OS Query so that you can follow along with the examples. So you can just go to osquery.io slash downloads and uh, download the Mac package and install that. And uh, you may see that Homebrew has OS Query, but there are some issues with uh, that installation. So please uh, just download the package from osquery.io. Um, I'm not, that's a good question. If you already have it installed through Homebrew, I would try to install this, uh, this package, and it will depend on how you have your path set up and stuff, which one gets used. But I think you'll be better off if you also install this package. OK, and uh, while you're all doing that, I, I'm just going to go through uh, some background before we get to the interactivity. So who am I? Uh, you already heard my name. Uh, I'm Zach Wasserman. And I've been an OS Query contributor since its inception in 2014. Uh, we started building it at Facebook to address Facebook's needs for uh, endpoint instrumentation across their, their Mac and uh, Linux fleet and later Windows support was added to it. Uh, these days I'm the co-founder and principal engineer at Collide, where I work a lot on open source software in the OS Query ecosystem, uh, as well as our commercial OS Query software. So what's the problem that OS Query is trying to solve? So as sysadmins, as security people, as IT folks, there's a lot of data on the systems that we manage that are relevant to the decisions that we make about how we manage those systems and what sort of uh, problems and threats need to be addressed. And so how can we find a way to reliably access this data, um, see what the state is in the present moment, and then monitor as, this as all of this information changes over time so that we can keep records and we can understand uh, how change is happening. So OS Query is the solution that we developed at Facebook for this. Um, it was open sourced in 2014, uh, and it's still supported by a core team at Facebook, uh, along with over 200 contributors to the open source project on GitHub. There's thousands of commits. Um, and I gave a presentation about OS Query a month ago, and I just had to update the slide because there were over 100 new commits, more than 10 new contributors. The momentum is really going. Um, OSCREATE.io, you already saw. Uh, so the big goals of the OS Query project uh, from the beginning were first to have really good support for uh, Mac and Linux because there were a lot of good agents uh, to run on Windows, but, but not so much that were good for running on the Mac laptops that most of the employees at Facebook were using and not to run on the, the Linux servers in the production environment. And we wanted to empower people who were not developers uh, to be able to access, aggregate, and derive insights from this data that lives on all these systems. So we looked at existing systems where you had to write Python scripts to retrieve the data, and you had to make a custom solution for each different source of data, and then aggregate them together through more custom built stuff. And a big goal was the performance and reliability to deploy it across the entire fleet of corporate and production infrastructure. And uh, OS Query at this point is deployed on millions of production servers because it's deployed across the entirety of Facebook's infrastructure, a lot of other big companies, and certainly tens to hundreds of thousands of Mac workstations. So it's, 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 fairly, it's fairly performant and very reliable. So what do I mean when I'm talking about this idea of uh, of unifying all these disparate sources of information. What are these sources of information, in, in particular on Mac OS? Uh, there, there are a number of them. 
there's, there's stuff we might be interested in in flat files like uh, the Etsy host file, the cron tab file, the SSH known hosts, there are SQLite databases that store a bunch of data, uh, there are system APIs that we can access, uh, but we probably would have to write scripts for that. There are application APIs, uh, Docker, Carbon Black, you might, people might be running those agents on their uh, machines. And we have event-based APIs like the OpenBSM auditing system, uh, or FS events, which allows us to keep track of file system changes. And then we just have this, the structure and metadata that's available in the file system. Um, we have, and on Mac, we have plists, uh, which are all over the place and, and have data that can be parsed and, and, and used really usefully. So how does OS Query uh, unify all of this information? And we decided to use the power of SQL. So uh, <laughs> not this kind of SQL, um, more like uh, up here, you know, select star from some table. So, so how many folks in the room are familiar with SQL? Great, okay, that's awesome. So most folks are, are familiar with SQL. So uh, I know you probably can't read all of this, but this is mostly just to show you that there are a ton of different data sources that are exposed as if they were tables in a relational database. And this is just the tables that are available on Mac. It's like 150 tables or something. Um, many of these tables are also available on other platforms, and there are many other tables on those platforms that are not available on Mac. So this is what uh, OS query queries look like in the most basic sense. Um, if we select star from hosts, we're getting the data from uh, Etsy slash hosts. Uh, but it's presented as though there was actually a table living in a database with that data. And the same or, or similar for all of these other different data sources. We can get metadata about it in stuff that's in the keychain as if it were in a table. Uh, we can hash files using, using SQL. We can keep track of events that are happening in the file system using SQL. And all of this just sort of magically lives there uh, through OS query. And um, none, most of this is not actually stored in a, any database. It's just pulled in when you query for it. OS query reaches out to the APIs, to the files, parses all the information that it needs, and then outputs it in the format that is usable. And this is literally SQLite. If anyone's worked with SQLite before, the syntax that we're using here is exactly SQLite, and the SQLite query engine executes all these queries. So here's an example of a slightly more sophisticated query that we might run with OS Query. Um, in this one, we're looking at the groups for each, quote, real user account, uh, where I'm calling real with a UID over 500 on the system. So on Mac, usually when you created a new real uh, user on the machine, it will have a UID greater than 500. And the point of this is just to show that we can use SQL to take these different data sources, the users table and the groups table, and we can join them and we can filter them to answer more sophisticated questions without writing any scripts or anything. Like we're just writing SQL on a shell here. And who's using OS Query currently? Uh, there's a pretty awesome list of companies that are uh, publicly using OS Query, and certainly more out there who uh, just aren't talking about it. But uh, like I said, it, it's deployed very widely, and people are getting a lot of value out of it um, all over the place. So let's dig into uh, using it. So we'll, we'll start with OS Query I, which is the interactive shell. Um, this would be just like a SQLite shell. It will allow us to write queries and see the results. And so this is really useful for just exploring what sort of data is available. Uh, and we can also use it as a part of scripting to use that, that uh, unified data source in any other scripting or other work that we'd like to do. And then often what we'll do is we'll use OS Query to get an understanding of what data is available 
and then we'll evolve that into monitoring through OS query D, which is the, the daemon. And we'll talk more about that later. So I'm going to switch to my terminal now. And um, hopefully you all managed to get the package installed. Did folks? Can I get like thumbs up if you got the package installed? Great. OK, cool. So um, and we have my, my terminal. OK, so if you're all in your terminal, are you able to uh, open OS Query I and see something like this? Awesome. Cool, so uh, let's run a query. Um, there's lots of uh, tables that we could access. And if we'd like to see what those are, we can do dot tables and just see an exhaustive list of them. Um, not super useful on its own. And really, if you're interested in this sort of information, what I rec would recommend is go to um, go to osquery.io slash schema, and then you can see more detailed documentation about any of these tables. And uh, you can filter by what's available on Mac OS, for example, and scroll through and get lots more info. But uh, in order to expedite this process, and because I know I know uh, some of these tables, I'm just going to like pick out some that I know, and we'll walk through. Uh, using them and what sort of in, uh, useful information we can get from them. So I, the, the table that I like to use every time I start up OS Query in a new environment just to make sure that everything's working is um, time. So we can select star from time. And we'll just get the current time, lots of information about the current time, different formats. Not extremely useful on its own. You have plenty of other utilities on your machine that will give you the time perhaps useful when you're doing other things with OS query. But, we're at, but hopefully everyone is able to run that query with no errors and, um, and see that working. I mean, I'll point out that this, can, this format can sometimes be a bit hard to read. And so if we do dot mode line like this, and then we run the query again, which by the way, like most shells, you can hit the up arrow and go back through your history. And you can hit Control R and search back through your history. And you can, you know, there's some tab completion and stuff. So all, all the, all, most of the cool stuff is there. Um, <laughs> um, so if we run this query again now that we turned line mode on, uh, we see the same data, but just in a sometimes friendlier format. And it depends on the data that you're working with, whether this format is uh, more friendly or not. And there's some other formats that you can use as well. You can get JSON output. And we'll talk more about that later. And I think if you do dot mode with some garbage, then it will tell you what the options are. Um, so we'll leave that there. Um, we'll leave it on, on dot mode line uh, for most of this. So let's do something that's perhaps a little more useful. So how about let's select from the apps table. So when I run this query, there's um, there's a ton of output, uh, more than I can really make sense of very quickly. But just to give you some background, the apps table searches all like the common places the applications are installed on a Mac, and then gives information about those installed applications. Um, and in an interactive context like this, getting that many results, not very useful. So um, first, we can sort of just get a sense of how many we actually got there, so we can Oh, sorry about that. So we can, we can do a count and find that, OK, there are 466 applications that were found here. So we probably don't want to scroll through all those results if we're just sort of trying to get a sense for what's going on. Um, maybe we just want one result. And I'm using the up arrow here again to uh, get these old queries. And another thing that I'll point out is, uh, I'm capitalizing these keywords here because I think it makes it easier to read. It's not actually necessary. Um, so we can limit the number of results that we get. So here's one. This is the first one that comes up on my system. Probably some of you also see this, and some of you also, some of you would see other values here. Um, is this, is like, is the notion of like, limiting and stuff, is that 
very basic for everyone here, or is this like useful information to know? Okay, cool. Um, so, so this just allows us to see like what is the data that we're that we're getting out of this table. Like, put it in some context on our actual system. Like, I could you know I can open the Finder right now and go see that there's application slash one password, um, and we can get uh, version information. We can see how it was compiled. Lots of useful stuff. Um, in particular, I think like version information can be very useful if you are looking out for applications that have vulnerabilities and you want to see if they're installed on your systems. You can use something like this. Uh, but we can also really drill down into results that we think uh, might be more interesting. Um, so, for example, maybe we don't really care too much about uh, any of this stuff from Agile Bits, like 1Password. Uh, so we could, we could add a where clause now, which says that we're only interested in results that match this condition. And we could say uh, where, and, and then we have, all of these, we have all of these columns to choose from that we could, we, could, uh, we could filter by. So we could say where the bundle identifier is not like, and then like allows us to use wildcards, so we can look at this bundle identifier, com.agilebits. And then the percent sign is our wildcard. And if we do this, it will now filter out any app that, uh, that has this bundle identifier. And since I'm anticipating probably a lot of results here, maybe I'll do a count first. So 465. Uh, unsurprisingly, we just filtered out one app there. Um, and then we can see, you know, what comes up next. And so th this is not necessarily that interesting because, uh, you know, we filtered out one app. That's not very useful. Um, but a, a context where it might be more useful is like, what if we want the list of all the apps that are not uh, the Apple apps? So we could do not like com.apple, and now when we do the count here, we'll see that we actually drilled it down a fair bit to probably some more useful information. And you can continue drilling down. Maybe you're interested in uh, the Adobe apps that are installed, and I think that would probably be com.adobe. And you can, you can drill down all these different ways to, to get to the data that's going to be most interesting for you. And also, um, we can select only the columns that uh, we're interested in. Like maybe I just want the paths of, of some of those apps. Uh, so I can select the path from apps where the bundle identifier is not like com.apple.star, basically. Limit that to 10, and then just there's some of those paths. Cool, so that's, that's the apps table, uh, one of 150 some tables. Uh, I'll, I'll move on to uh, talking a little bit about the signature table because it has a, a cool connection to the apps table. So um, as many of you are probably familiar with, um, binaries that are distributed to Macs, application binaries are often signed by the developer uh, that allows us to do integrity checking on those binaries or allows the system to do integrity checking on those binaries. And the signature table gives us access to the, the information about those signatures so that we can validate them and get the metadata. So we can take, like, uh, for example, on my machine, this, uh, this one password, and we can, we, can do, we can select against the signature table. And I'd encourage you to try this with any of the paths that came up for you. Cool, so here we can get the signature information on this. This tells us that the one password that I have is signed. 
Uh, it gives us an identifier that's, that can't be spoofed. Uh, it gives us the, the hash and some more metadata that's perhaps less useful. I think the most useful thing here is like, oh, this is signed. We know that this is signed. And this is not data that you, that you can't get otherwise. You can totally get this data um, from other tools, like uh, we could do code sign, the code signing tool. And we could see very similar information. But the argument that I'm presenting to you is that this unified interface that we have in OS Query that allows you to take all of these different data sources and access them through the same syntax and get uh, output that's compatible is the real power here. So you don't need to know all of these tools, you just need to go and look at the OS Query documentation, find the tables that have the data you're interested in, and then you can just start write, writing queries to access them. Um, something that I'll point out, is there a question here? Yeah, so there's a bit of auto-completion with tab. It's not great. Uh, oh, the question was, are there man pages? Um, so there's, there, there's a bit of tab completion, and uh, what I really recommend is go to osquery.io slash schema, and this is, this is the man pages, essentially. Um, sometimes very helpful, sometimes not that much more helpful than just looking at the column names, and um, when it's not helpful, let's try to improve it. That, the, the docs are all on GitHub and we'd love help improving those. Um, that'd be a great way to contribute if anyone's interested in contributing to the project. So, uh, let, let, let me point something out here. So, we might imagine like, oh, let's just get the signature of like every file that we can find on the file system. Can we just select star from signature? And the answer is no, we can't. So OS Query has a, has a, a bit of a, a weird thing which is do, not really congruent to other sort of database systems where some tables require that you give them constraints. The signature table doesn't know where it should be looking for the signature unless you give it a constraint. And so this, this message is letting us know that. So now we need to find a way, we, we, we likely want to find a way to pass information about these constraints into these tables that require them. Because for example, what if I do want the signatures of every app that's installed in the system? Well, we have a table that allows us to enumerate those apps, and we have a table that allows us to get a signature if we know the path for the app. So we can join those together using a SQL join statement to get that data. So that would look like this. And I'll just limit it to three because the signature table is a little bit slow right now due to a, uh, it does a very uh, deep verification of the signature, which is not the typical verification that's done by other tools. This is changing in an upcoming version of OS Query and then it will be much quicker to do all of them. But uh, let's just go back and look at that query. So essentially what this is saying is, it's saying like, go through all of the apps and for each of those apps, match it up with a row in the signature table where the path matches. So now signature knows where to go look for the signature. And then we get these results and we can see that down on the bottom here, here's the signing information for one password in addition to the rest of the information that we got from the apps table. And then here's a couple more that that I also had installed in my system. We limited it to three. Um, if you don't limit it, you'll watch it probably slowly start to spit out the results. It'll take it like 
probably a minute or something, and you can hit Control C if you need to stop that. Um, again, that would be much quicker soon if you want to do uh, a complete traversal of them. And now, there's actually a much simpler syntax that we can use uh, for this. So uh, w one thing I'll point out is we can look at the schema for each of these tables. And we can note that these both share that path column. That's what we use to join on. And, and tables sharing columns with the same name is a good clue that they may be joinable together. And really the simplest way to do that, which is essentially exactly equivalent to what we just did with this query, is to do this. We'll join apps to signature using path. And I'm still going to limit it here. And we'll get the same results again. So this is just different syntax for the same thing. But to me, it's much easier to think about it this way. I just want you to join apps with signature using the path, because the path is the thing that they share. And we can, we can then uh, continue to, to uh, do filtering on the results when we do joins as well. Uh, so we could say, like, OK, we're not interested in that Google stuff. So uh, again, like we did before, um, we can say where identifier not like com.google. And then we'll see that our third result was replaced with something else from com.apple. So that's a signature table. Uh, let's move on to another one that's going to help us illustrate um, some other important concepts and, and pitfalls in OS Query. Um, we can uh, select star from Chrome extensions. And the tab completion is more useful there because it's a bit longer. And uh, again, get lots of data. Um, we can check the count on this. 24 Chrome extensions on my machine. Uh, and these are the Chrome extensions installed for my user, because I've been running OS Query as myself. And, and so this is an important uh, place to point out a pitfall. Later, when we're using OS Query as an agent, we're likely going to be running it as root, because that will give it access to more data. And because of that, when we query a table like Chrome extensions, it's not actually sure which user to act on behalf of. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit Control C to exit the shell, and I'm going to restart it uh, as root. And let's see what happens when we query against Chrome extensions again. We get this error message letting us know that it returns data based on the current user, but there's no Chrome installed for the root user on my machine. Consider joining against the users table. So how do we do that? And this is a concept that you'll use uh, with a lot of these different tables that return data based on the current user. So the query would look like this. Oh, and, and, and how do we know what to join on? So let's look at the schemas. So they both share the UID column. So that's a good hint that that's the column that we should try joining on. So let's select star from users join Chrome extensions using UID. Oh, and we'll turn line mode back on again. And here we see 
then OS query enumerated the users, found my user, and then was able to retrieve the Chrome extensions for my user. So if there were multiple user accounts on this machine uh, that had Chrome extensions, we'd be seeing the results from all of them at this point. And an another pitfall that I'd like to point out is you might expect that we could do this. But in fact, we get this error again. And if you're into databases, you're probably thinking, this is really not good. It's not really how databases should work. And, and this is admittedly a wart in OS query because it's using the SQLite engine, which never expects that, the, that there would be a table that doesn't return results without constraints. So it just tries to go to the Chrome extensions table first, and the Chrome extensions table says, I don't know which user to look for, and then it's all over. So if you ever see an error like this, um, and you're thinking, I've already joined against the users table, or I've already joined against whatever table I need to join to, try reversing the order of the tables, and you may then get the results, uh, which is the initial ordering that we used here, and again, you will get the results. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Yes. Uh, let's, let's toss the cube. So, so I had a, a couple of questions. Like how uh, often is it actually doing the query? Uh, like how resource intensive it, is it? Yeah, that's a great question. So how often is it actually doing the query? The, the answer is only when you ask it to do the query. It's not storing any of this state itself. It goes out and looks up all of this information when that information is requested by the SQLite query engine. So in a bit, we'll show that you can schedule queries to run on interval, and those queries will run, cause this, all, this processing to take place, output the results, and then that data is, still continues to be stored you know, in, in the file system or in the APIs where they live. We're not storing that data within OS query, except in, in certain cases, which I will talk about later. And how, in, in terms of how performance intensive this is, uh, it really depends on the queries that you're writing. So one of the big goals of the OS query project was to make sure that this was super performant because we wanted to get this agent deployed out to the Facebook production infrastructure, and the people who manage that are very picky about what they let run on the infrastructure. So the, the performance is, is quite predictable. Uh, there's some tooling available in the OS query repo that you can use to measure the performance of queries. And typically, queries are very efficient. We don't, uh, we very rarely, uh, we, we try to never execute uh, additional processes. We always use the APIs. We always hit the files directly. Uh, there are very few cases where anything goes outside of the OS query process to get the data. So, so it's essentially as efficient as it could be to access any of this data. How do you deal with uh, uh, paths that are like protected by uh, system integrity protection? Or um, if, if you're testing out uh, the current uh, beta of uh, Mac OS, you know, certain directories that uh, might give you uh, some problems. Yeah, so in, in my experience with system integrity protection, you can often, uh, at least as the root user, you can often do reads against those protected directories, and OS query is read-only Right. at so this current time. And what about that second part of the question I asked in regards to uh, the current beta? So we don't, we don't have any capabilities to do anything that a root user can't do. So if there, if there are things that can't be done in the current beta, then we don't have access to any way to do that. There's no kernel extension in OS Query, which is you know, a, a, a blessing and a curse. It means that stability is really good. OS Query will never crash your system. Um, but we don't have access to things in the kernel that are not exposed through APIs. Cool, and we'll do, and we'll do a, a, an extended Q&A session later. Uh, and we'll do like maybe one or two more now and then uh, continue along, so please. I just want to know if performance is 
Oh, we invented it. <laughs> Good question. So, uh, uh, on one, one good use, I think, for OS Query is to uh, check for compliance with uh, best practices for security. So, for example, uh, what if you want to know about whether the application layer firewall is configured on a machine? Of course, you can look it up in system preferences, uh, but we can get that data in OS Query. Um, we can get the SIP configuration. Uh, and again, this is, this is data that we can find through other command line tools like uh, CSR util status, system integrity protection status enabled. Uh, but if we wanted to uh, get that into our log aggregation system or use it for scripting, like we'd have to be parsing that data rather than getting good structured output from OS Query I. And I'll point out that um, we can when I say structured output, like we can get JSON output. And so this can be piped into your Python scripts or whatever you want to do to make use of this into your log aggregation systems. And, and we'll see later that the OS query daemon can run queries on a schedule, give us that structured output, and uh, do lots more. Um, so uh, we, can, we can get the disk encryption status. And uh, you probably saw some error messages pop up there. This is due to recent API changes. But we do, in fact, get the correct results about what's encrypted. And again, this is something that we could get from disk util APFS list. And, um, and we'd have to parse this data. But OS Query gives it to us uh, ready to go. Uh, we can get gatekeeper information. We can uh, look at the sharing preferences. So uh, like the sharing preference pane and system preferences, uh, we can basically get all of that right in one table. Everything's disabled on my system right now. Uh, we think that that's a good practice to have uh, all that sharing disabled by default. And uh, at Collide, we think that this is like this kind of best practice uh, is like really good thing to encourage for your users. So, so we focus on this kind of stuff a lot. And um, we can provide that information to like you as an administrator through OS Query or the users themselves through OS Query. So um, just for a quick example of what that looks like, as an administrator, you could see how your users' compliance is with those best practices. Uh, and you can define your own best practices. And um, we have a desktop app that will allow them to see how their compliance is doing, because we think that users want to be secure. They want to follow best practices, and they want to know what those are. So we've learned how to use OS Query for a bit of exploration, for understanding what's going on on a system. Uh, but I did have monitoring in the title of this talk, so how can we do monitoring with OS Query? And that, the answer to that is that we have the OS Query daemon. So the daemon allows us to schedule queries for continuous results. Uh, we say how often we want the query to run, and it will run the query on that interval and provide the output to whatever logging pipeline we're interested in. It can write to the file system. It can write to AWS. It can write to syslog, uh, lots of different places. And it has a differential engine to see how state changes over time. So if you want to see that, for example, someone updated their sharing preferences, they were all off yesterday, and today they turned on file sharing, and then the next day they turned on Bluetooth, uh, 
you can track those changes over time. So you don't, you don't, you have the option to get snapshots of the exact configuration and state of the system at one time, and you can also get get the differential changes of the system. And then there are these event-based tables that help us ensure that we're not losing any data, even when events happen between the time that queries run. So if you want to be sure that you catch every process that's executed, well, running a query against the processes table every second means that, one, it's expensive, and two, a process could exist between the times the query runs, and we wouldn't catch it using this differential engine. But with the event system, that data is stored within OS Query and then extracted when you run a query against the process events table, for example. Uh, and that one in particular uh, requires some more configuration, which I will link to some resources for that later. Uh, other events-based tables would be like uh, file integrity monitoring uh, with the file events table. There's a hardware events table that gives all the events from USB devices that are uh, plugged in and unplugged from the machine. So in OS Query D, we provided a schedule of the queries we'd like it to run, and uh, once we start it up, it just does that. So we'll go through a little example of how you could configure OS Query D there, here. So we'll get back in our terminal, we'll quit OS Query I, and uh, please don't do this one, or it's actually probably fine if you do, uh, but not necessary. Uh, so let's uh, make a directory, uh, make dir uh, temp slash os query test. And we'll cd to that directory. Should be empty. And then we'll copy the configuration file that comes, the example configuration file that comes bundled with the os query installation. Um, so that will be in var os query os query dot example dot conf. And we'll just copy that to os query dot conf in our new directory. Are folks keeping up with this? Cool. Uh, and then let's open that file for editing. Uh, since I don't know what tools you have, I'm just going to use text edit. Uh, this should work on any machine. Uh, open dash a text edit osquery.conf and here it is probably very illegible for your, all of you is it legible now yeah. cool uh, so there's a lot here uh, and we're just going to focus on the schedule section for now there's documentation that you can use to uh, get an understanding of, of much more that you can do with this but right now we'll just look at what it looks like to schedule queries and uh, oh, and, and your file looks different right now because I think this must have reloaded. Um, revert. Your file probably looks more like this. You have a system info query. So uh, we talked about, for example, tracking as the sharing preferences change over time, and. So I'm going to add a, a query here called sharing. So we just give it the name that we want the logging output to have. And let's say select star from sharing preferences. And because uh, we don't have an hour here to do this demo, uh, we'll set a 10 second interval. Uh, it's up to you what interval you set on your queries. I typically don't go under 10 seconds, and I think that an hourly interval is just fine for most queries. Uh, these queries are, are cheap to run, but there's no reason to be running on them all the time if we don't need that data to be so up to date. So we'll save that file. And one thing to be, to, just to be aware of is uh, Remember in JSON, you can't have a trailing comma, so uh, no trailing comma here. And then we will run 
OS query D, the daemon. And this is going to be a bit of a long command uh, because we have to give it various configuration options. So we'll tell it to use that config that we just created. We'll tell it to create a database in the directory that we just created, our test directory. We'll tell it to create a PID file in this directory. And OS Query uses this to ensure that there isn't more than one OS Query instance running against the same database uh, and allows it to kill the other running instance if you instruct it to. Uh, we don't need to worry about that too much right now. And we'll tell it to log into this directory as well. So it tells us that some event publishers are not enabled. Uh, many, so I was talking about the event-based system around process events and, and file events and that sort of stuff. And those need special configuration and aren't turned on by default. So you, we don't have to worry about these messages about event publishers not being turned on. But we can see now uh, in the output that uh, our scheduled query is being run. And we can see that it stored the initial results for the scheduled query. By default, this, the queries are running in differential mode. So we would just be getting the differential logs. And then we can, um, um, so in another terminal, we can cd back to uh, slash temp slash OS query test and see that now we have a number of files that OS query created in addition to that configuration file, including our results log. So we can tail that. And we see that initial result. So this is that same result that we saw earlier. All the sharing is turned off. And even though we've seen in this other window that uh, the query executes a bunch of times, nothing has changed. So we only get one log output. So now if we open up our system preferences, go to sharing and enable something, then we'll soon see that OS Query picks up that change and logs a new event. There it is. And something I'll point out is uh, we have this action removed. So it's, it's saying, I used to have this, this row in this table where it was all zeros, where all of the sharing preferences were disabled. But now that row is no longer being returned from the table. A row was added to the table where they were all turned off except for Bluetooth sharing. In a table like this, when there's only one row that gives us all the information we want, that removed log is not very useful. Removed might be more useful if we're, set, if we're doing a query against, say, applications. Someone removed an application, and so we might want to actually see that log that the application was removed. We don't want to only see new applications. So we can modify our configuration to not show that removed line. So we'll add removed false. We will save the file. We will, oh, we can keep that going. We will restart OS Query D and it will pick up the new configuration. And uh, we'll see that it's still executing that sharing preferences query. Nothing new has been logged because still nothing has changed. But uh, note now, when we go to sharing preferences, I'll turn off Bluetooth sharing and I'll turn on printer and file sharing.
And next, we'll expect to see a line was added, uh, a row was added, right, with file sharing on and printer sharing on, but we didn't get any new removed line, which was not really very useful in this case. So that's a, that's a very brief overview of OS Query D. Any of the queries that we wrote before in OS Query I, we can run in OS Query D. We can run them in this default differential mode where they show us how the state changes over time. We can run them in snapshot mode where we'll get a result for that query every single time it runs. And we can ask OS Query D to log this output to the file system and then we can use uh, Logstash or the Splunk forwarder to push these logs to like an elk stack or Splunk or anywhere else that we'd like to be able to do analysis. And there's lots and lots of stuff that we can do with OS Query D. So this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. And just as an example of one of these event-based tables, uh, the hardware events table doesn't require any special configuration. So you could just add a query against the hardware events table and uh, plug in a USB device. And then, uh, I don't know if you all can read this at all, but you can see uh, in this example, you may be able to see that uh, a USB device was attached and uh, it was like my dongle. So it says it's a USB 3 hub, it was my dongle. It's over 9,000! So what should we do with all this power? Uh, and I'm just gonna run through fairly quickly some uh, ideas, some inspiration to uh, build this into a system that's, that's uh, going to provide a lot of value for you. A question here. Do we have the, the microphone? Yeah, if you have um, two events between your polling times, like a USB device is inserted and removed, you get no loss, right? So you poll, nothing's changed. Inserted, removed, you Right. Okay. So, n so no, sorry. Um, incorrect. Um, so right was acknowledging your question. Okay. Um, but the answer is uh, no. With these event space tables, these ones that have the underscore events at the end, you will get all of the events that occur between the time the query was last run and the next run of the query. So sharing isn't different than that. Sharing, so sharing is different than that. Right, so if you set, if you, if you ran that sharing preferences query every 60 seconds and someone turned on their sharing for 10 seconds and then off, and during that 10 seconds was not when the query ran, you would not get that result. You would get no, you would get no change at all. With one of these events tables, uh, you will get all of the results. A question here. In that realm of the hardware events, uh, or event streams, how does that, you said, so it takes all the events, so um, I also, you mentioned OpenBSM logging, so how does that play in, the queries play into an OpenBSM log? Can you utilize the queries to narrow down the scope of those logs versus just getting a flood of OpenBSM logs instead of? Yes, absolutely. So with something like OpenBSM, you can configure which OpenBSM logs make it to OS Query at all. And, and I should note with all of these event-based tables, OS Query does actually have its own internal database. So I, I sort of lied to you a little bit earlier. Most of the data that OS Query has, it retrieves at the time you ask for it, but OS Query does have its own database where it stores data for these event-based tables and also where it stores this differential information. So you can configure the ingestion so that it only ingests data that you're potentially uh, interested in. And then you can still write sophisticated queries that do all this matching and stuff uh, using any of this power of SQL against the event-based tables. And you can get a baseline against all of that like you previously
as you mentioned, based on you know queries and like system utilization and stuff like that. That'll work on the event streams and stuff as well. Yes. Okay. So, wh where to go from here? Uh, the OS Query repo has a number of what we call query packs, which are collections of queries that are recommended for scheduling against your hosts. Uh, for example, these are things like uh, the OSX attacks pack, which looks for indicators of compromise uh, based on various uh, Mac OS malware samples. Uh, there's other ones that just give you sort of like baseline system information. And this is another great way to get involved in contributing with the OS Query project. If you think that there's useful data to be collected, sharing those queries is an awesome way to make sure that everyone else can also be collecting that data. Um, and these are intended to be like uh, a baseline and inspiration and, and you have to know what you care about in your own environment and what you need to be tracking in your own environment, but these are a good way to see what some other people care about in their own environment and, and to get started on yours. Uh, Palantir also has a repo with additional queries that they use, and it's more good inspiration. If those 150 tables that are available on Mac uh, don't provide the data that you need, you can build your own tables. It's actually really easy. Uh, on the left here, we have a minimal example of building your own table in Go. On the right, building your own table in Python. Uh, then you can query these tables just like any other table in here. You can join them against the built-in tables. Uh, you can unify all of this data. So a lot of people take advantage of this because it's really easy and because folks are doing things uh, that are custom and aren't relevant to the entire uh, community. You can implement a central management server or, or run one of the existing ones. Uh, at Collide, we built Fleet, which is an open source management server for, uh, for OS Query, and this is gonna allow you to run live queries against all of your online hosts. So not just you schedule queries and you get results pushed into your logging pipeline, but you wanna know right now the answer to some query, and you wanna target it to some set of hosts. You can do that through a tool like Collide Fleet. There's also uh, Zentral, uh, various others, and uh, the Collide Cloud commercial product does this, and uh, you can build your own, and people do. It's not too hard to build your own if you find uh, any of the existing solutions lacking. Uh, you can also use a tool like Fleet to manage these uh, query packs and configurations that are sent down to your nodes. So, so if you don't have great capabilities, for updating those packs through Chef or Puppet or Jamf or whatever else you're using to push down configurations to your computers, you can just push a configuration once that allows your OS query daemons to connect to something like Fleet, and then you can continuously update the queries and the options that the agent's running as you go. We also built the Collide Launcher, which is just a wrapper around OS Query. It, it runs the OS Query process, but the, the killer feature is auto-updating. So if you're in the kind of position where it's not very easy for you to update packages that you deploy, uh, you can install the Launcher once, and the Launcher will securely auto-update the OS Query instance. And it also has like a bit of tooling that makes it easier for you to create packages to deploy. Uh, to your infrastructure. And it's fully compatible with uh, regular OS Query because it actually does run regular OS Query. Push logs into an aggregation system like the Elk Stack so that you can create dashboards, uh, alerting, and, and do historical analysis. Uh, Elk Stack is very popular in the OS Query community. Splunk is very popular in the OS Query community and um, this data can be really useful. Victor, uh, who works at Collide, who some of you may know, uh, wrote a cool blog post about conditionally installing software using Monkey, 
and using OS Query as a data source for, for creating those conditions that you use to install the software. This is not a screenshot of OS Query, but this is some uh, audit data. But again, there's, there's process and socket auditing. Uh, there's file integrity monitoring. Uh, there's a lot of advanced features in OS Query that you can use to meet some more serious compliance and security needs. And uh, Chris Long from Palantir wrote a really good blog post outlining some of this stuff, which is linked at the bottom of this one. Uh, we also just hosted an OS Query conference, uh, the first OS Query conference, and the videos from that are up. There's lots of good ideas that folks presented there. If you'd like to get more in depth on OS Query, definitely check out querycon.io uh, where the videos are. And uh, like I said, we built this cloud product where we wanted to take all of this data and make it super useful, go directly to insights, handle the whole log aggregation pipeline and, and, and turn all of this data into action. So if you're, if you're interested in OS Query, there are kind of two paths to go down now. Uh, you, in order to go, well, I, I should say, OS Query on its own, OS Query I is very useful. Like you can SSH into a machine and open up OS Query I and get lots of useful data. Or you can write Python scripts that call OS Query I and get JSON output and parse that and take action. Um, so OS Query I is really useful on itself, but if you want to get deeply invested in OS Query and really get the full value out of it, then you need configuration management. You need log aggregation, and you probably want it to do alerting somehow. And there are two ways to do this. Uh, I think you can, you can go to commercial vendors uh, like Collide. Uh, we build an awesome cloud product. Uh, that gives you the insights, or you can go with open source tools. Uh, like I said, uh, Collide Fleet, Zentral, give you that configuration management, give you the live querying, um, and then you have to have your own log aggregation pipeline, maybe Elk Stack, maybe Splunk, um, and you have to build alerting and stuff with that on your own. And there are actually a couple of more talks coming up uh, at this conference that outline uh, each of those approaches. So uh, Jason Meller, the CEO of Collide, will be talking about our cloud solution and how it leverages OS Query to give you really good actionable data. And Lucas Hall uh, from Saturna Capital will be talking about uh, Collide Fleet, which is our open source uh, OS Query fleet manager and how you can use that to build like an open source stack to drive this full value out of OS Query. So those are both tomorrow. Jason's talk is at 9 a.m. And uh, Lucas's talk is at 3.15 p.m. in this same time slot. And I highly recommend them both. If you have any questions about OS Query once you leave this conference, uh, please join us in OS Query Slack, like the Mac admin Slack. It's very active and very helpful. Um, you can also create questions on Stack Overflow tagged with OS Query. And um, that's it for the slides. So thank you. If you'd like to get in touch, <laughs> if you'd like to get in touch, uh, there are a variety of methods here. And uh, otherwise, uh, I'll be at our Collide booth in the hallway. and. Um, I'll take any more questions that folks have. We have 12 minutes for that, and otherwise, uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> you have a question? Oh, hey, Zach, uh, in the select application, does it do any greater than, less than with non-integer application version numbers? We don't, we don't right now have any great handling for that. And um, it's something that I've thought about. You can hack around it by writing some pretty ugly SQL. Um, but this is something that I think is probably worth looking into. And if you're interested in that, uh, please file a GitHub issue. And, um, or if you write C++, uh, please just file a, a pull request. But, but at least if we can get an issue around that to understand like 
how much uh, interest there is in that and what the sort of solutions are. Like, I think it's definitely a sensible feature, and I'd love to get it in. So OS query is written in C++. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's why, that's why extensions can be written in, in Python, in Go, in anything that speaks thrift. Um, but there's really good support for both Python, Go, and C++. And you can write also custom logging extensions, configuration extensions, uh, as well as tables. So you can integrate essentially anything with OS Query. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you, were, you were saying uh, that OS Query D was storing differential in information there from the queries that it was running. Was it doing that with that uh, the system preferences query that you had running so you could actually have it tell you what time that state changed? Yes. Yeah. So with that sharing preferences query, it was storing the last results for that query each time the query ran. And then it only logs if it finds that the results have changed. When it finds the results have changed, it logs the differential along with the timestamp. Okay, any chance you could show that real quick? Yeah, yeah, Thanks. totally. So uh, that's, that's back to here. So, so here's the new value. And remember, in this configuration, we turned off removed. So the differential includes which rows were removed and which rows were added. In the case of this table, there's only one row every time. So really, we're not interested in removed because if anything changed, the added row just tells us the new value that we're interested in. And the previous added row tells us the previous value. So we can turn off removed for that one. For other ones, we would log those removed rows. And so when we log it, it will be logging the time that the query executed. For those event-based tables, where they store events between query executions, those tables uh, will include the exact time the event occurred. So we don't know from this query, from this query, we don't know exactly, exactly when the user changed the preference. We just know that the preference changed in the interval between the query being executed once and again. Santa and leveraging some of this in conjunction with that, um, I, I've seen some rumblings online where it sounds like there is the potential of writing some data back out to the endpoint with that. Could you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so some folks have started, so so one of the, the core principles of OS Query has been that it, it must be a read-only system. Um, this is, this is, we think, a benefit to a lot of folks who just wouldn't be able to deploy a software that would be able to do writes like that. But we have this rich extension API that means that we can do a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff in extensions. So there have been some recent changes made that allow extensions to be deployed uh, where you can do inserts and deletes and you can use that to, I think, sort of one of those proof of concept tables was uh, for managing the Google Santa configuration. So I think for folks who are interested in doing right actions with OS Query, there, there is a future for that, and, the, and, it's, and it's soon, it's now. Uh, but it's not through the core OS Query project. Anything else? With the, uh, the differential ones, how long are those held for? What, what causes those to be cleared out? So the, the, the logs that we're looking at right here are just, it's just JSON being logged in a flat file. So uh, those differential logs, you know, you could do some log rotation scheme on them. You can write them out with your log aggregation system. But a differential, but a result is just stored from the last time the query executed. Then when it executes again, we do the, the, the diffing, write out the differential results, and then we store the new results. So then we can wait until the query executes again. Yep. Is there, what happens, like, um, how would you, like, if someone was to turn off the OS query daemon, would that then flush that, the stored one? No, 
You, no, if the OS query daemon is off, obviously no results will be logged uh, while it's off, and also no events will be captured uh, while it's off, but the, the data is stored in um, a RocksDB database on disk. And so, you know, this is one of the reasons why, like, OS query runs as root, so that you can have that file be run under root, and then either you trust your users to run as root, or you have SE Linux or something, or you don't trust your users to run as root, and then they can't tamper with the OS query process or that file. All right. Well, thank you all. I'll stand around for a few minutes and you can find me at the Collide booth.